Welcome everybody to Portland Works. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'm Chris Cook. I'm the current chair of Portland Works, and my day job is as a lecturer, not in history but in management. But I do have a, a strong interest in the history of Sheffield. What I'm going to talk to you about today is a talk that I put together as a keynote speech for the British Society of History of Medicine. So it was slightly commissioned research, and I quite enjoyed it. So I thought it deserved an extra outing. So the title, The Dirty, the Idle, the Drunken and the Disorderly, People, Public Health, Politics and Philanthropy in the 19th Century Sheffield, probably needs a little bit of introduction and explaining. So let's start with the title, if I can move my slides along. There we go. So part of the title comes from the Sheffield Mercury from the 16th of June, 1832, talking about the national cholera outbreak also known as King Cholera at the time. And the Mercury reported, the cholera is likely to come to Sheffield. It chiefly attacked, it attacked chiefly the dirty, the idle, the drunken, and the disorderly. A wonderful example of the people of Sheffield. Um, later in the same decade, those of you that know railway history, the original prospectus for the Sheffield of Rotherham Railway was published, and the people of Rotherham were worried about the drunkenness of Sheffield spreading to Rotherham. You will find that drinking is a theme when it comes to public health today. But what I'm interested in is how industrial centers develop. And I've done research in the past about how the armaments industry has developed in Sheffield. I'm now looking more broadly across the whole industrial center. And one of the ways that I look at this and interpret this is this idea of systems. We have an industrial system which connects all of the different industrial units together, things like the cutlers company, individual cutlers, large steel works as well. But beneath that, we have a range of different systems that are operating, which allow a town centre or a city centre or an industrial centre like Sheffield to work. We have a system of governance. We have a system of religion. We often have a system of public health, which is part of what I'm going to talk about today, systems of education. And what you find is that you have individuals who overlap between all of these different systems. Business leaders, politicians, philanthropists, people who are connected between all these different things. And the reason I like the word systems rather than networks is the systems will persevere. The system of governance will persevere over centuries, whereas the people who are governing them will often disappear within 60 to 80 years. So let's dig into this a little bit further by starting with looking at Sheffield in 1831. So just before cholera gets to Sheffield in 1832, the census of 1831 showed Sheffield had a year, just over 110,000 inhabitants. And Sheffield was really governed by three ancient institutions. You have the Cutlass Company of Sheffield established in 1624, about to celebrate their quadcentenary. You have the Burgess of Sheffield, which goes all the way back to 1297. And you have the Church Burgess as well, established in 1554 by direction of uh, Queen Mary, essentially to govern the land around the church and also maintain ladies' bridge as well. And between these three institutions, you get individuals who are connected between the people who are town collector for the church birds and for the Burgess of Sheffield, also are cutlers and so on. But what we have is a town which is much smaller than what we know today. And the picture I have is Sheffield from Bridge Houses, a little bit later than 1831. One of the things I really like about this is that you essentially have three hills and three churches. The sort of sprawl of the modern day city isn't there. We are still very much a small town geared towards industry. And that's what you're starting to see here with the chimneys as well. So let's start by thinking about a key individual when it comes to this idea of public health in Sheffield. Somebody many of you may have heard of, Thomas Asseline Ward, who was born in the late 18th century and lived to the ripe old age of 90. He is somebody who begins as a cutler. He gains his freedom after being trained as a cutler in 1802. He becomes master cutler in 1816, and then for many years he's a town trustee and also a town collector, which means he's the one who collects the rents. He unsuccessfully runs for Parliament in 1832. But we see here an individual who's connected to different networks, somebody who is connected to the cutlery industry and the industrial networks in Sheffield and the industrial system, and also acts as a town trustee. Now, Ward is very interested in public health, and I did some digging into the uh, Sheffield archives, some records, and discovered these minutes here, which is the first record of 
a meeting to set up a dispensary in Sheffield. A public meeting held at the town hall on the 22nd of December, 1831. Not the town hall we know today, of course, the town hall which is sadly falling down on uh, Haymarket. Uh, Mr. Thomas Warden, the chair, it says it was resolved that in the opinion of the meeting, it is highly desirable that a general dispensary would be established in the town, in the, I'll read the handwriting here, in the central part of the town. This is one of our first public health institutions for the people of Sheffield right in the centre. We have the Royal Hospital, which is slightly different, but this is really looking at the public health of people in Sheffield. And if I can move on my slides, we have a picture, an illustration of this. Actually, I'm skipping ahead. I've not remembered the order of my slides. Let me talk about cholera and then talk about the public dispensary. So we're starting to see the need for more public health in Sheffield through the work of Ward. And then as that Sheffield Mercury outlined in 1832, cholera does come eventually to Sheffield. After that meeting the set up a public dispensary, there was a Sheffield Board of Health established in July 1832, chaired again by Ward. When cholera does get to Sheffield, it kills over 400 people in the town. And we all know the cholera monuments, which still stands to today, commemorating all of those deaths. Now, the belief at the time was that things like cholera would only affect the lower classes, the poor of the town, not people who are governing in sort of semi-higher classes which is why it's a great surprise to everybody when the master cook of John Blake passes away of cholera in 1832. One of the main issues here is poor sanitation in Sheffield. And poor sanitation is an issue which continues all the way through the 19th century. And this is a key issue in the spread of the disease. It, as it is waterborne, when you have poor sanitation, things like this will spread very quickly. So the public dispensary is set up and established on West Street. This is an illustration. It eventually became the Royal Hospital on West Street, roughly where there is now a Tesco and a Nando's. The only thing that survives of this is down on the side streets heading towards Division Street is the entrance to a Mount Zion um, venue now, which used to be the old outpatient center. It's very large columns, very classical architecture. But the public dispensary has in its early years, is very useful to the people of Sheffield. The annual reports show the people admitted, um, and these are all available at Sheffield Archives. They're very, very tiny, sort of quarto sized documents, but you can start to see the impact that they had. The patients admitted for the 12 months from July 1832, we're in 12 month increments as we go across the screen here. We see at least when cholera is around, over 2,500 patients admitted, and then roughly 2,000 patients admitted and cared for each year thereafter. These are people who wouldn't have ordinarily had access to any sort of public health availability, aside from maybe local apothecaries. We also see a small number of midwifery patients being admitted rather than treated in their homes. And it is midwifery where we all know some of the main public health interventions of the 19th century which I'll come on to shortly. So you can see, at least in the first five years of this establishment, that this is important to the people of Sheffield. If we count up across the screen, that's roughly 10,000 inhabitants of a town that in 1831 had 110,000 inhabitants. Roughly 10% of the population has been treated by this dispensary in its first five years. As we move through the 19th century, we can start to see some other instances of public health being recorded. In this case, in the book, The Conditions of the Working Class in England in 1844, written by Friedrich Engels, who is more famous for his friendship with Karl Marx, of course. I've got a little extract from that book on the screen here. And he says, in the Sheffield, wages are better, and the external state of workers also. On the other hand, certain branches of work are to be noticed here because of their extraordinary injurious influence upon health. Certain operations require constant pressure towards against the chest and engendered consumption in many cases. Others file cutting, but then retard the general, sorry, general development of the body and produce digestive disorders. Bone cutting for knife has been headaches, villainousness, and among girls, many are employed anemia. 
By far the most unwholesome work is grinding with knife blades and forks, which we all know of. Especially when done with a dry stone, entails certain early death. The unwholesomeness of this work lies in part in the bent posture in which the chest and stomach are cramped, but especially in the quality of sharpened edge, metal dust particles freed in the cutting, which fill the atmosphere and are necessary. The dry grinding of the life is hardly 35 years. The wet grinders exceed, then exceed 45. Dr. Knight in Sheffield says, I could convey some idea of the injury, I can't say the word, injuriousness of this occupation only by asserting that the hardest drinkers among the grinders are the longest lived among them. I mentioned drinking will come back up again. <laughs> because they are longest and often absent from their work. Drinking, of course, is useful to public health in this instance. They are in all some two and a half thousand grinders in Sheffield, about 150 of which ATR men and 70 employees are four grinders. These die between the 28th and 32nd years of age. The razor grinders who grind wet as well as dry die between 40 and 45 years of age, and the table cookery grinders who grind wet die between the 40th and 50th years. What we are seeing here is that industry is one of the main issues when it comes to people's health, especially in grinding. Shortly after this, there is a change in the in structure of Sheffield. I talked about those three ancient institutions, the Church Burgess, the Town Burgess. And in 1843, Sheffield becomes a borough for the first time, which changes that institutional base of Sheffield. We start to have elected mayors for the first time. Changes who are essentially those in power when it comes to public health. And one of the first things that Sheffield Borough does just three years later is establish a health committee. And I've got this little extract from Sheffield Archives that explains what the health committee is all about. It says the committee was charged with the provision and maintenance of public conveniences, inspection of food and other matters related to sanitation and public health. It controlled public baths, investigated nuisances, it was responsible for the cleansing of closets, removal of refuse, restricting the types of trade, scavenging and cleansing and washing of the streets, and the various acts of parliament, for instance, sale of food and drugs, canal drops, arson dwellings, factories and workshops, and infectious diseases. They're essentially starting to take control of many of the issues which have played Sheffield for at least 10 years in terms of the general health and also some of those issues which stem from the cholera outbreak in 1832. And they order a sanitary a report on sanitary condition. Now, this is available online to download. If you've ever used the website archive.org, you can take a look at this. And I have a little extract here, which is basically all the areas around where Jesus was ultimately built behind West Street. And it does not paint a great picture of public health in Sheffield. As it says, there are uh, on Woodhouse Lane, a lane is Regent Street, and other narrow passages, filthy from accumulations of all kinds of refuge and drainage. And Red Crop, besides being nasty, is for the most part inhabited by dissolute refugees. It goes on to talk about inferior housing, directly corporate from one to another, mm -hmm. inhabitants and suffering illnesses arising from causes sore from mentions. There are four houses in Smithshire receiving drainage from privies to the great detriment of the health of the inhabitants. Two of them are laid with fever. It goes on to talk about the accumulations of nitrous soil and ash. The fault of building only privy to several dwelling houses is in the stream. And it's likely to be mental. When it comes to the difficulty of getting the issues of which only exist in the most favorable circumstances, it's greatly aggravated and more frequently incurred from the rapidity with which they become full. Reading between the lines, people are filling the toilets so and we can't enter them quickly. That is great in public health issues. We, of course, are used to flushing toilets in our homes. Almost two centuries ago. And again, it does not paint a great picture. But these are the things that the Public Health Commission are hoping to start to fix in general. We can start to move on through the century. We've looked at the 1830s, 1840s. We can move now to the 1860s. And again, look at one of these individuals that are big linkers between different circuits. Somebody here, Thomas Jessup, who we've all heard of, was a great philanthropist in Sheffield. He was probably one of the wealthiest individuals in Sheffield in the 19th century. 
is well is probably comparable to about a millionaire. He's a steelmaker out in Brightside, and again, he is a town councillor in the 1840s, and he becomes master cutler, mayor, and borough magistrate in 1860, becoming a linker between all of these different networks in Sheffield. He has an active interest in the welfare of Sheffield as citizens, which leads towards his establishment of a hospital. I have an extract here again from Sheffield Archives, which is a book of meetings which are to set up a maternity hospital in Sheffield for the first time. Now, we know Jessup's Hospital, which was not the first maternity hospital in Sheffield, it was set up long before that, and the money for that came from Thomas Jessup in the 1860s. So this is normal meeting here from 1812-1853. It says, uh, what does it say? Thomas Jessup, master cooker in the chair. And it goes on to say that it is the opinion of this meeting that it is desirable to establish in this town a lying in hospital dispensary for diseases peculiar to women. Now, we have to cut through the language of the time here. Diseases peculiar to women is essentially saying things that are against the ease of women, essentially maternity issues. We use the word disease now to mean things like what we had in the pandemic, of course, but this is essentially saying the misuse of women. This is also reported in the Sheffield and Rome Independent at the same time. It talks about that there's a charity which is set up. It says the charity which is now proposed to establish will endeavor to carry out four chief objectives. First, to attend women at their homes when in labor and to train midwives for that purpose, who in all cases of difficulty will be directed to call in the aid of one of the medical officers of the institution. We are starting to see doctors essentially caring for women and midwives looking into people's homes. This is many years before, but I always get visions of Paul the midwife when I think about this point here. Second, to receive outpatient women suffering from diseases peculiar to their sex. Again, that idea that it is issues that are pertaining just to women. Third, to maintain a few beds for inpatients who cannot be satisfactorily treated at home, and to promote the advancement of medical science with reference to midwifery and again diseases incident to women. And the first hospital I have. An illustration here of course the following year in 1864. This is behind where the cathedral is. I believe it is bordering roughly where Paradise was. And I think the building is still there, but I haven't been able to essentially track it down. The following year, they reported that they had treated 514 patients and they had had 331 births, a roughly 50 50 percent split between boys and girls being born under their care, and extra beds added in 1865. And we see that expansion of the hospital as we move towards Jessup's Hospital being established later in the century. So the site was brought close to where the University of Sheffield's Diamond Building now is. The site was brought in 1875 and it opened in 1878. It was entirely paid for by Thomas Jessup's kind donation, roughly £30,000, which is about £3 million today, which is why they named it Jessup's Hospital for Women. And this name that perseveres to this day. I was born at Jessup's Hospital in Sheffield. My two daughters were born at Jessup's Wing at the Hound Hospital. The name at least perseveres, even if the hospital doesn't. And in November of the year before it was established, they were discussing furnishing the building, and Thomas Jessup reported that my only wish is that as much of the work as can be should be given to our townspeople, providing the goods be of satisfactory quality. So not just is he looking after the health of women in the town, he's also saying, what can we get from the people of the town, from the craftsmen of the town? Go to the carpenters of the town, go to the cookers of the town, see what you can do to kit out this building. Again, thinking about the health in many ways of uh, financial and of public health of the people of Sheffield. In the same minute book that I showed you earlier, there is a report held the day that the hospital is opened. This is the first minute. For the following resolution be proposed at the general meeting of the subscribers that the most cordial thanks of the inhabitants of Sheffield are due, and I hereby mostly gratefully tendered to Mr. Jessup 
for his magnificent charity he provided for the use of the poor of the hospital which we have this day assembled to open. Lots of this message of saying thank you to these philanthropists, thank you to these people who are linking between lots of different networks and shepherds. And part of this is also that command of social resources. Thomas Jessup is essentially a celebrity of the town. He has wealth behind him as well as goodwill. And also people are respectful of him. People are understanding the track record that he has. And it's this idea of social resources, which also feeds into some of my conclusions, that you need people who are known to be, have good track records in order to deliver this sort of project. So let me draw together some conclusions and say thank you to everybody for listening so far. So as the 19th century moves along, there's this continued desire to improve the health provision extended to the people of Sheffield, often the poorest in community. How do we improve the health of everybody, not just those who can afford it? We start to see this complex relationship between institutions like the church burgess, like the town burgess, like the um, health board, and institutions and individuals involved in public health evolving over time. It's increasingly a political issue in the 19th century. You see that at the establishment of the Borough of Sheffield and the Health Board. But you have key individuals on philanthropic and nervous and the command of those social resources I was just talking about, which are often a source of influence and change in Sheffield. So altogether, as I said in my title, this is about people, public health, politics, and philanthropy in Sheffield. Thank you everyone for listening.